Hey guys, so we're picking up right where we left off in part one. So if you didn't catch that, you're definitely going to want to go watch that one first. So we have all of our bullets spawning in, and now we're going to see how we can add physics to get some collisions in here. And then we're going to get some enemies spawning in that we can kill. So in the last one, I had you create a collision layer script, but we didn't do anything with it. So let's quickly fill that in. I'm going to throw a wall in here just as a quick test since we don't have any enemies in here yet. But let's add the enemy layer in here as well because we will need that. And we'll need to create those layers in Unity if we don't have them already. And just make sure that your layers correspond to the numbers that we set up in the collision layer script. Okay, so let's go back to our bullet system to add the physics checks in there. We're going to add the unity.physics namespace. And at the top here, we need to get a reference to our physics world singleton. And down here, we need to create a list of type collider cast hit or whatever type of collider you want to use. A collider cast needs two points passed in to create the shape, the left point where it starts to curve, I assume, and the right point as well. So I'll go ahead and create those. All right, so now we need to add some more data into our bullet component. Let's add a size for the size of the collider, and let's go ahead and add damage while we're in here as well. All right, so back to the bullet system. Now we make a capsule cast, and we'll grab the size from our bullet component, and no direction, a distance of one is fine, ref hits, and we'll need a new collision filter. So it belongs to, meaning what layer is actually on this entity and its default. And we set collides with, and right now we're just looking for a wall. And again, we'll change this shortly to allow a check for wall or enemies. And for now, if the number of hits is greater than zero, then we'll just destroy the entity for now, meaning the bullet. And native lists have to be disposed of manually, so let's do that. Okay, now let's add in our wall. And interestingly, even though we're in 2D, you need to add a box collider, not a box collider 2D. I guess ECS physics only interacts with regular 3D colliders. And we have to move the wall into the sub scene, otherwise it's just a normal game object that will not interact with entities. And there you go, you can see we've got 50 bullets every single frame with collision detection and the bullets getting destroyed when they hit the wall. And we're still managing to run this at around 70 frames per second, which is not too shabby. Okay, now I'd like to get some enemies spawning in here. So as with everything in ECS land, we will need a component and a system for that. And since I'd like to just set a prefab and some of the variables right in the inspector, we'll need an enemy spawner authoring as well. I'm going to use this sprite for our enemies. These assets are free on the asset store. Link is down below in the description. And while we're in here, let's go ahead and add a capsule collider to him and make sure that he's on the enemy layer and turn them into a prefab because we'll need that. And let's add an empty game object called enemy spawner into our sub scene and add our authoring script on there. All right, let's do the component first. And there's a few things that I'd like to add in here. The prefab we want to spawn, the number of enemies per second that we're gonna spawn in, I also want to increment that number with each wave, so what's the increment amount? I also want a cap, so what's the max? And I want to spawn them in a circle around the player, so let's get a radius, as well as a minimum distance away from the player so that they don't spawn too close to you. And finally, time before next spawn, and current time before next spawn. Okay, so let's do the authoring next, which is basically just gonna be setting all of these component numbers. So again, authoring scripts take mono behavior data and turn it into ECS data on our component. So we'll add in all the same variables here as well, except it'll be a game object, not an entity, and we don't need to set current time before next spawn in here, so we'll just ignore that one. Again, we set up a Baker script, inherit from Baker, of type enemy spawner authoring. We get our entity, which is basically this game object. It just translates it into an entity. Then we add a component to this entity and set all the variables on it. 
For entities, you can't just directly set an entity to a game object, so we call get entity and then pass in the game object. But everything else we can just set directly from authoring. Which again, authoring is referring to this model behavior. So that's the data portion. Now let's actually make a system to handle spawning in the enemies. So here are all the namespaces we're gonna need. We'll inherit from I system. And here are all of the variables that we're going to need. An entity manager, an enemy spawner entity, enemy spawner component, and a player entity. Okay, so let's set up our on update function because in there, every frame will need to get our data. Again, this is just kind of how it works in ECS land. So our entity manager is equal to the states entity manager. For the enemy spawner entity, we can use this to get the entity based on the enemy spawner component. We know we can use get singleton entity because there's only going to be one enemy spawner in our scene, otherwise we'd have to do this another way. The spawner component, we can get the component data like this. And player, we grab like this because again, just one player. Now let's create a method called spawn enemies and call it here. So first we'll decrement our timer. And don't forget, we actually have to call set component data in order for the changes to actually take effect. Now we'll say if our current time before our next spawn is less than or equal to zero, meaning our timer is up and it's time to spawn something, then we'll loop through our number of enemies to spawn per second. And first off, we have multiple commands to process, so let's set up an entity command buffer. Then we'll instantiate an enemy. And now I want to position that enemy that we just spawned in. So we'll need to grab some transform data, one for the enemy that we just spawned in and one for the player. Now let's test this before we do any complicated math to get them spawning around the player. And to do that, we'll need to call our entity command buffer dot playback, which actually runs all of the changes that we made. And then we need to manually dispose it. We also need to reset the current time before next spawn back to the time before next spawn, or they're just gonna infinitely keep on spawning in. And we already set that component data here. Let's make sure we add the enemy prefab to our enemy spawner authoring script. And I'm just gonna change this to one so it's easy to tell if it's working. So yep, one spawns in and it will continue to spawn in every two seconds. Now, since we're spawning in enemies, I need to add their component data to them. So real quick, let's create an enemy component. It's only going to hold two things, current health and enemy speed. Okay, so let's get back to our enemy spawner system. Now I want to spawn enemies in a random position in a circle around the player. And getting random values is a little bit more complicated in ECS if you want it to be compatible with burst. First, we need to set up a random variable up here using the mathematics library. And in our onCreate method, let's set that equal to create from index and get our hash code from our enemy spawner component. Hash codes are always unique. And now that we have a random variable, we have a bit of math to do to figure out the random placement around the player. Okay, so I'll just quickly type it all out here so that you can copy it. So we're getting the squared minimum distance from the player and we're creating a random offset using random.nextfloat2 direction multiplied by random.nextfloat, which is gonna pick a random number between two numbers, one being the minimum distance from the player or one being our full spawn radius. We grab our player position, create a float2 for our spawn position, which will be our player's position plus our random offset, get a distance squared from that spawn position and the player position, and if that distance is less than the minimum distance squared, then we'll set the spawn position equal to the player's position plus the random offset multiplied by the minimum distance squared. So that was a lot, but really that was just a way of getting a radius around the player that is at least a certain distance away from the player. Okay, and then finally we'll actually set the enemy position. Next, let's do our rotation. And again, this is just more math. There's nothing too different here because it's ECS. 
So we'll get our direction, which is the normalized difference between the player and the enemy. We'll calculate the angle of that direction, and I'm subtracting 90 degrees only because my enemy is facing straight up. If his sprite was facing right, for example, then I would completely skip this line. Then we convert that into a quaternion using axis angle. And then set the rotation. Okay, so we've set the position, we've set the rotation, now we will finally actually set that component data. And since they've been spawned and positioned and rotated correctly, let's add their enemy component. So let's make sure that's all working correctly. I'm gonna crank this up to something ridiculous so I can tell if it's working. And yep, they're all spawning around us and facing us. Not every single frame when I actually move around will do that in enemy system, but they are spawning in and looking at us when they spawn in. Now to finish this off, I just wanna increment the number of enemies that spawn in each second. Really simple, just to make the game slightly harder over time. So we'll set our desired number of enemies per wave, which is our enemies per second plus our increment amount. And we'll get the lesser of either that or the maximum amount of enemies so that we don't go over our maximum amount. And then we actually set it to that number. And again, our component data is already being updated here, so we don't need to do it again. Okay, so let's actually damage these guys. Real quick, let's go back to our collision layer because I want to show you how we can do this if we want to be able to hit more than one layer. So I'm going to set up a class and a static method that returns a uint. And we're going to return layer one or layer two. This is a bitwise or here. And I'll link some more information about bitwise operators below if you want to know more about that, but that has nothing to do with ECS. Okay, let's go back to our bullet system. And instead of just destroying the bullet, let's go through all the hits and make sure we return the hit entity. And if that entity has an enemy component, then we'll get that component reduce the current health by the damage amount, and then set that component data to update the health. And if the enemy's health is less than or equal to zero, then we will destroy them. Okay, and we're destroying the bullet outside of the for loop, so it'll die once it's registered all of the hits. And finally, we just need to set up a layer mask from that helper function we set up a minute ago, and change the collides width to that layer mask. And we have a couple of variables from our bullet component that still need to be set. So let's do it in player system when we actually fire the bullet. All right, let's hit play. Okay, so we've got some enemies spawning in and we can kill them, awesome. So the last thing I wanna do is get these enemies looking at us and moving towards us every frame. So we're gonna set up an enemy system script and open that up. Again, here are all the namespaces inherit from I system, and we'll need an entity manager and a player entity. We're gonna set the entity manager to the state manager, and we'll grab the player and the player transform. Now we can't use get singleton entity on the enemy because there's way more than one, so we need to get all the entities and loop through them all. And if the current entity has an enemy component on it, then we'll move them towards the player. So we'll need the enemy transform and the enemy component since that has our speed variable. And let's calculate the direction. And now actually increment the enemy position. Okay, so position is done. Now let's get them looking at the player. And this is exactly the same as the enemy spawner system math right here. So you can actually just grab that and copy and paste it in. And we're setting the component data here. And there you go, 50 bullets per frame, eventually hundreds of enemy ships per second spawning in with physics and movement all running around a nice 60-ish frames per second. There is one more thing I'd like to try to get that higher again, and let's just see how it goes. I'd like to try using burst compile on our enemy system and our enemy spawner system. I don't believe either of those had anything in there that's not compatible with burst.
I'm not seeing a big boost, maybe a couple of frames higher, but I'm still very much learning the ECS system. So if you know more about burst, then let us know down in the comments what could be done better here. I hope this project inspires you to give ECS a try. It's definitely more complicated than object-oriented programming, a little harder to wrap your head around it, but the performance implications are incredible. If you want the source code for this project, my patrons get access to the source files on GitHub for every tutorial ever made on this channel. So go check that out if that sounds interesting. Hope you enjoyed, guys.